I pull to the side of the road and I go, this isn't working. I have to do something else. Um, and, and I wish that I could, I could say that the very next minute I started off on my new career, but it took, oh, uh, you know, eight months to 16 months to, you know, to 18 months of trying to figure it out. Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast, a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy with yours truly, Michael Kahan. My guest today is Steve Kaplan, who is an author, producer, director, consultant, and a teacher. He's been the industry's most sought after expert on comedy. In addition to having taught at UCLA, NYU, Yale, and other top universities, Steve has created the HBO Workspace, the HBO New Writers Program, and was also the co-founder and artistic director of Manhattan Punchline Theatre. He has consulted and taught workshops at companies such as HBO, DreamWorks, Disney, and Sony, and plenty more. He's also the author of The Hidden Tools of Comedy and The Comics Hero's Journey. In addition to private coaching and one-on-one consultations, Steve has taught his comedy-intensive workshops to thousands of students in the United States and countries all around the world, including London, Toronto, Galway, Athens, Paris, Tel Aviv, Sydney, Melbourne, Rio, Munich, New Zealand, and Singapore. In this podcast, we talk about how a cab driver became a comedy expert and a leader in the comedy space, fear of failure, love of comedy, and truth in comedy, finding your voice, hustle, reinventing yourself, and more than once, vulnerability to pain and success. Thank you so much, Steve, for agreeing to do the podcast. Thank you. So I've got a bit of a brain teaser that I like to ask all of my guests. Oh I my hope, God, I hope this isn't math. Okay. Uh, it's not, I'm but ready. it's harder than math. It's probably okay. the hardest question I'm going to ask you. Okay, I have a pencil and paper ready. <laughs> so if you were on Tinder, what would your bio say about you? Oh my God. I knew it would be I, I, I have to tell you that I'm old enough to not know exactly what Tinder is. I, I think I know. Is Tinder and Grinder the same thing? Tinder is Grinders for gay people and Tinder's okay. for everyone. Okay. Oh, date, they're both okay. dating apps. Oh, the, okay. Um, my my bio would be if if you're reading this, I'm already in big trouble. Uh, <laughs> Because it means that I've gotten divorced. So that would be bad. Yes, we don't want that. But if you if you were on Tinder and you had I was to have on a, Tinder. You're always okay. If if you were on Tinder and you were allowed a bio for whatever reason, would you put something comedic I, on I it? I would I would probably put down uh I I I try to help people I, I try to help people laugh. For a living. Oh, that's awesome. So now that we'll get into the more serious questions, even though that's probably the most serious question I'll ask all day. So you teach. I also, I like, I like long walks on the beach. I'm a Libra. My favorite color is blue. Is that oh, too thanks. much for Tinder? Would, it, would that, would that so also work? I've said this on my previous podcast. Some people put like inspirational quotes, which they obviously don't follow. One person <laughs> had like a Buddha quote. And to be honest, I'm never going to take advice off a Tinder bio. It's like you can achieve anything you want to, which is, you know, maybe that's a great quote. But on Tinder, I think it's missing the mark. And I've seen so many of these ones. But oh, the Buddha, got, Mother Teresa one's the best, actually. I, I got a good one now. Uh, okay. how, how, about, how about this won't be the worst mistake you ever make? <laughs> but it'll be up there. Okay. <laughs> so you teach comedy, writing, and performing. In addition, you've taught at UCLA, NYU, Yale, and other top uh, colleges. You've created the HBO Workspace, the HBO New Writers Program. You've been the industry's most sought-after expert on comedy writing and production. You're also an author, which is super cool, and you've written two books, The Hidden Tools of Comedy and The Comic Hero's Journey, as well as the co-founder and artistic director of Manhattan's Punchline. Don't worry, we've, we've got a little bit more to go. 
You've uh, directed in regional theatres and off-Broadway, and you've consulted for companies such as DreamWorks, Disney. I don't know how to pronounce this one. Is it Ardman? An- Ardman. Animation? Ardman. If you, you've probably seen their movies. They're the ones who do all the stop-action stuff. Oh, okay. HBO, and you've worked with producers and production companies from all around the world. Your alumni, which is, I'm shocked to read this. I'm just going to pull it out. Have been nominated for 43 Emmy Awards, six WGA Awards, three Golden Globes, one Academy Award, five SAG Awards, one American Comedy Award, and they've won 10 Emmys, one Oscars, and heaps more. How on earth did you get this far? Um, through through dumb luck, um, dumb luck. <laughs> and uh, and the and the good offices of other people. What do you mean by that? You, you know, like a lot of help uh, along the way. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 like every other self-made man. I was given help all along the way, um, but I'm uh, I'm either humble or stupid enough to admit it. Well, it's a, it's a massive achievement. Did you think how how long have you been in the business for? Well, uh, I uh, when I got out of college, um, I drove a cab, but after that, I basically have been in the entertainment business for. Uh, you know, 40 odd years. Whoa. And when you were um, working as a cab driver, was your intention to get into entertainment? No, I was looking to become a full time professional cab driver, but I just washed out. So, so getting into the entertainment business, that was my fallback plan. Of course not. You know, I, I, I went. I went to college. Uh, I, I majored in theater. Uh, my my biggest dream was I wanted I wanted to be a working actor. Uh, I never you know I didn't have any illusions of being a star. I wanted to be that character actor who was in everything and you never knew his name, but you went, oh, I know that guy. Is it kind um, of like that? Sorry for cutting off that Adam Sandler movie where they've got you can do it, Rob Schneider. But even though he's been in heaps of other things, but he's in all those little movies, and you recognize him from that little skit. Oh God, I hope not. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but you know, if if you if you watch if you watch HBO or Netflix or Showtime, and you oh, I saw that guy. Who, what 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 else was that guy in? You know, everybody in Deadwood um, is <laughs> okay. oh, I know that guy. That's 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 really what my dream was um and because at the time uh, when i was you know i was very young i i had no dreams um uh, but it turned out luckily i guess for me that i wasn't good enough to not be uh a a featured actor um let let alone a star i uh i i found myself much more comfortable and much more comfortably uh you know behind uh, the the curtain or be, behind the camera, as it were. Uh, I was opinionated. I was arrogant. So of course I became a director, and <laughs> and uh, and and. Uh, but I've always been fascinated by comedy. I've always I've always had the desire to make people laugh. I wanted to make people laugh, uh, even when I wasn't being able to make people laugh. I I I, I actually. Uh, did not do stand up. Um, I have a uh, a Never joke. Before. Well, I I I I was. Let me see. I I entered into a couple of talent contests, but but if I have to be honest, and since since you know there there's nowhere else you should be honest, but on a podcast, if I have to be honest, <laughs> you know, I I, I, I I never really did stand up, although. Um, I do have a great joke that I use in my classes. Uh, that's actually a lie, but but I say that uh, I was places asked me never to come back. Like stand up clubs asked me never to come back. Like not even as a customer. But um, boom, and um, <laughs> and it gets a good laugh. But the reality was, is I was too afraid. Uh, I two things. I was too afraid to do it, and I realized I didn't really have anything to say. I. Uh, I didn't have the burning desire to to complain about uh, a in, uh, a number of things that that all my uh, compatriots, my stand up friends, were doing. I didn't have 
uh, the desire to hide behind a persona. So I became deeply, deeply uh, interested in, in uh, figuring out why people were laughing, what was happening, how to help other people laugh. Uh, when I was still pretty young, uh, a, uh, uh, a guy came to me and said, uh, he and a friend want to start a theater company in, in Manhattan. Um, and, and would I be interested in, in helping out or, or joining them? And I thought, absolutely. And I, we had a meeting and I pitched them the idea because I think they wanted to do the normal kind of theater company where you're going to do uh, a checkoff for three sisters uh, and, and you're going to do some contemporary plays. And I, and my pitch to them was let's do something different from what everybody else is doing. Let's, um, let's, uh, Sorry, let's, that. okay, yeah. sorry about that. No, let's, no, no, no. Uh, let's do, let's do a theater that's only, com that's completely devoted to comedy and only comedy. Okay. And uh, I, I had to kind of convince them that it would, it wouldn't just be a, a stand-up club. Uh, and, and so we started this theater company in, in New York called Manhattan Punchline. And we did plays, but we also did, uh, evenings of sketch comedy. Um, uh, we did uh, improv nights. One of the people who was uh, the one of the mainstays of the improv of our house improv group was Michael Patrick King, who has gone on to being the head writer for Sex in the City and Two Broke Girls. Oh, wow. um, one of the one of the playwrights uh, that we worked with uh, was David Crane, who that was uh, years before he did Friends. Uh, and we had some you know great actors like Oliver Platt and, and Mercedes Rule. Um, these are these are names that if you know New York theater, they're there. And Oliver's done a lot of uh, TV and, and film as well. Uh, and so uh, while I was doing this, I was teaching an improv class and and I started to realize that I really didn't know how how it worked, uh, and and no one else did either. I mean, everybody had a had a thought about well, if you did this, this will be funny. If you did that, that'll be funny. But um, what what I started to do was I started to try to break down exactly what was going on. What was what was the the physics and the the art and the science of, of comedy. How does it work? Why does it work? What's happening when it doesn't work and what can you do to fix it? And so that's, that started everything. And so what exactly is comedy in your eyes and why is it so important to you? Why do we need humor in our life? Um, well, those are three questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I think comedy, uh, to me, the, the shorthand is, uh, and I, I, I differentiate between performance comedy that you would see in, in a stand-up routine or, or movie or, or TV show or play and humor uh, where people are simply writing humorous texts or essays or, 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 or even funny tweets. But uh, in terms of performance comedy, narrative comedy, uh, you could call it, uh, I think the, uh, to me, what it is, is it's, it's whatever's telling the truth and specifically telling the truth about human beings. Comedy oh, tells okay. the truth about human beings uh, in a way that, that drama does not. I mean, if you take a look at a, at a, at a great dramatic TV show or, 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 or play, if you're looking at Hamlet, uh, even though these people have flaws, they, all these flaws are, are either noble or tragic or, or larger than life. And, um, and, and in a way, drama helps us dream about what we could be. I mean, you know, Hamlet, he's, you know, he's this, you know, the melancholy Dane, he's indecisive, you know, he's mourning his father, he's trying to figure out what's going on. Um, the, and, and yes, he's got, he's got flaws and he's, 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 uh, not a perfect person, but all his flaws are appropriate 
and and kind of logical and rational. Um, for instance, uh, if you've seen a, a production of Hamlet or Shakespeare in play, yeah. um, if it's a drama, uh, there Hamlet is, and he's doing his big soliloquy, to be or not to be, and all of a sudden, in the middle of his soliloquy, he farts. <laughs> to be or not. Now, now people do fart, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it happens. I mean, we, we, we eat stuff and, and we process it and there's, there's, you know, the whole digestive system and, and it occurs. But what would happen if, if in the production of Hamlet you're watching with the very uh, poetic Hamlet going to be or not to be, what would happen if he farted? Yeah, uh, people would respond quite, uh, they'd probably burst out laughing. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it, maybe it's embarrassed laughter, or but you know, there would be some there would be some rude people who would laugh. And so, the de- the deal is is that drama helps us dream about what we could be. Would that we were that soulful and that that that, that you know that emo. Um, uh, you know, if you watch a soap on television, everybody's gorgeous. Um, so drama helps us dream about what we could be, but comedy helps us live with who we are. Comedy uh-huh. tells the truth about what it's like to be human. Um, so that's the first part of that question. The second part of the question was, uh, why do people need it? Yep. Um, people need it because, uh, because it, helps, it helps put life and your life in perspective. Otherwise, you're going to, um, you're going to spend uh, you know, your whole life kind of sitting home, weeping softly, writing lyric poetry. Uh, you, <laughs> you, you need, you, you know, comedy helps you realize that, that it's, it's all just one big crapshoot anywho, as, as Stephen Tobolowsky says in, uh, in Groundhog Day, that it's that, you know, God is a comedian whose audience is too afraid to laugh. That's Voltaire. And, uh, and that, that there's, you know, the, the 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 grand gesture, the the basic gesture of the comedian is a shrug, you know, basically saying eh, you'll live, um, because no matter what happens, you'll live, and and if you don't live, then you don't have anything to worry about anyway. So you don't have anything to worry about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So 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 it's not that drama has no point or has no purpose, but comedy's purpose is to help you live life. If Did you if if this character can go through this and still make you laugh and ju- and that and just think of every chaplain movie ever then then maybe what you're going through is not so bad so um, for, you, for you has it helped ease situations or make you feel better do you use comedy when perhaps you're experiencing a tough time and it's kind of helped you well i mean now you're talking about um what are the psychological terms? Displacement, and um, and uh, you know, a lot of times uh, we use we use comedy as uh, as kind of a defense mechanism. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, uh, so I'm I'm not sure that comedy helps me deal with tragedy, but but the ability to see life sideways never hurts and I mean, have you, you know, yeah sorry no i mean you 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 know there there are times in which uh bad things happen and and you're miserable but hopefully if you have uh developed a sense of seeing the absurdity of life um you can you can uh you can get out of feeling sorry for yourself yeah, and that's very important. A lot of people go to victim blaming and why is this happening to me? And right. it's very hard to step away and realize that most of the time it's not that serious. Well, or or it is serious, but but uh, again, if it hasn't killed you, maybe it's not as bad as you think it is. Yeah, and if it nice. does kill you, then you don't have anything to worry about it after that. So so like again, that. again, it's it's all good. It's all it's all great. And are you able to keep that mentality throughout your your career? No, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So how, but, has there been um, a big shift in recent years? 
Um, I mean, I, I, am I able to keep the mentality of, of, no, I mean, listen, I've, I've been married uh, a long time. So, so yeah, little things, you know, little things can upset me and we can have a fight about a little thing. And hopefully I have, you know, I have some ability to, at a certain point, kind of step back and go, boy, I was an asshole. I'll never, I'll never admit that to her, but <laughs> I was an asshole. Uh, now, how can I get out of this seeing that I was an asshole? And a lot of times you know, I'll simply, um, I'll, I'll simply surrender and say, boy, that guy, who was that guy? He was some asshole. It's okay now. I'm here now. Um, uh, but uh, I, I think, I think more than anything else, um, uh, comedy has the uh, ability to. I, I was reading this article uh, the other day in which in which there was a scientific study that shows that that comedy, uh, laughter, and and the the stimuli that that leads to laughter creates chemicals in the brain and the body that are healing. Yeah, I'm not surprised um, by that. What's the old cliche? Um, the doctors. What's the doctor's recipe for having a good laugh? Um, um, what's that's on the tip of my tongue? Uh, humor is the best the, medicine. Oh, humor is the best medicine. Okay, I, I was I was thinking more. Look at that! Look at that dope in the in the, in the bed who's about to undergo surgery. Thank God you're not him. But I guess, <laughs> but I guess humor is the best medicine. Is much is much better, and it's pithier too. Yeah. Well, we could. Yours can be the fallback. Okay. <laughs> You mentioned before about fear, particularly with trying to do stand-up comedy, but doing, you know, running your own business, being a consultant, teaching, you, you have to be very, you're putting yourself out there. That's very vulnerable work. How has your perception of fear changed? If you were the person you were now, would you be able to do stand-up comedy 40 years ago? Um, that's, uh, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure the answer is yes, not because I wouldn't, I would still have, uh, I would not be able to deal with my fear, but more so that uh, there's a reason why I'm, I work with writers, but I am not a, uh, a script, a screenwriter myself, uh, because I'm, I'm desperately uh, interested and and uh, taken with stories, like a, from a director's point of view, but I don't have stories within me. Uh, have you, so have that, you written? Have you written? I've, stuff I've, written, I've, I've, written I've written these books. I've written, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, the uh, Hidden Tools of Comedy and the Comic Hero's Journey, and I've worked with uh, hundreds of writers and producers, both as uh, a theater director and as a script consultant. Uh, and I'm I'm fascinated by stories, and I I think of myself as as a student of storytelling. Okay. Um, but like many directors, I don't have the burning desire to sit in a room and make up a story myself. I'm much more interested in in looking at your story and saying, "Boy, this is a great oh oh well, that's a problem. Well, maybe maybe if you yeah. maybe if you didn't do that, that, that story would be stronger. So that's, I mean, everybody has a skill. Now I think, I think one of, one of my, um, one thing that has stood me in good stead is the fact that I haven't been mistaken for long about what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. I mean, and that's, that's, uh, I'm thankful for that because there are a lot of people who go for years, if not their whole lives, trying to do something that they're not suited for or not very well suited for. Um, so I'm I'm just happy that I found something that I'm good at uh, that I was able to uh, parlay into uh, into a living in, in, in into a career. In comedy, we often talk, or well, it's often talked about finding your voice, and you know, in particular. Right with stand up a lot of comedians when they're first starting up or even, you know, during the end of their career, they're not being necessarily authentic or true, pardon me, to themselves. 
has that been like similar for you finding your voice finding what's best for you or did you just kind of just realize very early on what would make you succeed i i think pretty early on um, awesome i got i got the idea that i was that my my best uh, my one of my best skills was being able to quickly synthesize a problem somebody else's problem so um uh so you know, one of my director friends used to say that he loved me sitting in on a uh, a dress rehearsal because i could tell him in one sentence what not only what was wrong but how to fix it and oh, so that's amazing. That's, and so that was one skill that i had um and the other i guess the other one is simply having worked so long in in comic narrative that i've i've um i've been able to kind of unlock some things that were maybe not apparent to everybody when I, when i started when i started i was working with young actors i mean i was a pretty young myself but i was <laughs> i was at least i at least had a couple of years on the young actors i was working with yeah. um and so when i started teaching what came to be the hidden tools of comedy i thought okay uh, i've got it i've got this uh, this stuff sussed out but i mean it's because these kids don't know anything they're they're just learning but if i were to give this to professional comedians they would go oh please i already knew this or oh that's wrong but what i found out kind of to my surprise was that um was that professional comics and and working writers would take a look at the stuff that i was doing and they would say either oh my god i never i i, I kind of knew something like that but i never knew it i never i i, I never knew how to put that into words or else you've given me a a uh, a syntax a language to describe what i kind of knew um uh, yeah, yeah. I kind of knew instinctively and also how to you've also shown me mistakes that i've made that i hadn't realized i was making so so those two things uh pretty quickly um i i i was able to uh discover myself um, that's right and at the same time yeah. i realized i'm not that good an actor i'm not that good a joke teller um i'm uh you know and uh and i also discovered that uh that there's a whole process of of creation that is agonizing to me there's nothing to me there's nothing more agonizing than working on a play for you know for two months and then rehearsing it for a month and then putting it up and have nobody liking it uh to me that's that that's um that's pretty close to to death uh so i found i found out that um you know the 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 thing that i thought was going to be my greatest failure which is when my theater company closed because you know we had no more money um became actually something liberating to me because there was a lot there was a large part of it that 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 made that uh caused agony um uh, i i i hate being judged <laughs> and and what do you do when what do you do when you're when you're running a theater company you're just putting stuff out to be judged so i much prefer i much prefer um uh teaching and lecturing than doing what i was doing before which was uh uh being a theater director so so everything's worked out and i guess the thing that i've realized more than anything else and and this has come through through many many years is that the thing that you're afraid of is never the thing that you should be afraid of because the thing that you're most afraid of is is ultimately going to be okay it's all going to be okay and the, and why you spent all that time being afraid of it is crazy so if you had simply put your energy into not fearing it then um then you would then something else might have happened but any but in any event it's all okay it's all okay 
it's very interesting. I'm going to ask you a question about the failure side in a second. But, you know, when I first started improv comedy, that was the scariest thing I could ever think of was getting up on stage and doing improv because whereas with stand up, you can plan it and you got more control. When right. I first did improv, I, I'm not a very nervous person, but I was experiencing nerves for the first time. And I think one of the first scenes they made me do in class was like, say, like, pretend you're a sad person. And I was like, how do I show that? And I felt extremely robotic. And then the next class, we had to pretend we were aliens and we loved each other. And we had to go through the motions of showing love. And I found that so hard. And like, I could do that in my day to day life with like people that I, I know, but with strangers and doing all that stuff, I found that extremely challenging. But after, you know, a few weeks, a few months, I felt a lot more comfortable. And I came to the same conclusion as you. you you know, it was the scariest thing at the time, but it really was nothing in the scheme of things. Right. So re my question about failure, when the theater, well, what's your kind of definition on failure? Do you view that we actually fail? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, yeah, we don't all get a participation trophy for showing up, you know, um, uh, you, you, get, people break up with you, uh, 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 projects don't come to fruition or, or turn out badly. Um, uh, I, uh, I had a theater company that I had to close. That was, that was, uh, at the time it was pretty devastating, but How if you, you can, well, 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 go ahead. Say that again. Uh, I was just going to say, how did you pick yourself up and continue? Because, you know, you put in all this time and energy and you've invested your heart and soul into the theater and it's closed. How do you bounce back from that? Well, luckily, I have very low tolerance for alcohol and drugs. Oh, that's great. So um, so luckily, uh, I was not able to self-medicate in that way. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I, there was... Um, there, there, there was some crying. Crying was involved, um, which I just uh, want to say is actually quite a healthy thing to do. Yeah, I mean, uh, but you know, I I could be watching a uh, a, a beer commercial and I would start crying uh, because it, it all seemed so sad to me. Uh, uh, and I I took action. Uh, there's. There's uh, an old saying that 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 action is the success. The results are out of our hands. So so I I took action. Um, I decided that uh, that I had to that I wanted to or I needed to relocate. I was in New York and I thought there's if I stay here, what what am I going to do? I'm I. I'm not going to resuscitate this this organization. It it owes too much money, and there's not enough funding, um, and there's not enough support. Uh, what do I do? I I I've been producing and directing comedy, and I've been re, you know working with writers. So I thought, well, let me go out to Hollywood because I think I think those are marketable skills, and so I took action. I. I went uh, without a job, with no, you know, with just uh, my brother was living out uh, in a suburb of uh, of Los Angeles, and I kind of bunked with him for a little bit and before I got an apartment, and I made connections and I reinvented myself. Oh, amazing. And so I I I uh, convinced a friend of mine, um, somebody who I'd went to college with. I walked into his office. Uh, and I said, hey, you remember we went to college? He said, don't you remember? We also went to high school together. And I had actually forgotten that. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so I, I pitched him uh, a project and he said, okay. And between okay and getting the first check was about nine months. So that was that was pretty agonizing. But still, you you do what you need to do. I, I, I did this and I did that. I, I you know. I was, you know, making money, keeping my head above water, and then I got that pro did that project, and then that project led to another project, and then that project led to another bad uh, career decision, 
uh, these two people who were talent managers uh, asked me to join them. And I said yes, thinking, well, I spent my whole career spotting talent and developing talent. But what I didn't realize was, oh, but this is not about spotting and developing talent. This is about being a salesman. Yeah, and, exactly. And it took, uh, let me see, from, it took about four years, three or four years for me to realize that that was a skill that, that eluded me. Um, I was a terrible salesman. Do you mean eluded as in distracted you? No, um, it's just, uh, you know, you know, if you're, if you're uh, a greyhound and you're chasing the rabbit around, around the, the track, uh, you know, and that uh, you're, you're, you, it seems like you never catch up. So uh, I, okay. I was chasing this skill that I thought, well, I'm a smart guy. I'm, I'm a hard worker. Uh, but it's, it's a skill that, that was, uh, that I was not able to corral, um, partly because it requires lots of lying. And while I'm, I'm okay with lying, <laughs> uh, I'm not good at it. Yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not good at it where it counts, which is I'm going to lie. So you give me money and I don't care about the consequences. Uh, so you've got morals and ethics. No, no, I thought, you know, I, I really <laughs> didn't think I did. I didn't think I had moral and ethics. I, I just, um, I, I guess I have a conscience and, okay. uh, and I, I was unable to, I was unable to screw people over in a conscious way. I'm sure I have screwed people over in an unconscious way. And for that, if you're listening to this podcast, I apologize, and I'm willing to make amends if you come up, if you if you uh, can contact me. But um, what I was <laughs> not willing to do was I wasn't willing to, um, or I wasn't able to, to be uh, kind of a programmed asshole, or or let me see, um, I wasn't able to be ruthless. And okay. And that was that was um, so maybe every ruthless person isn't an asshole. That's that's that's, you know, probably a drawing with a very broad brush that yeah. that's ruthless people don't deserve. But I wasn't able to be ruthless. Uh, I wasn't able to swim with sharks and I wasn't I certainly wasn't a shark myself. So when you, when you talk about like because you've consulted so many people and companies over the years how would you differentiate between giving ruthless feedback or would you not view the no, feedback? No, 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 not ruthless feedback. I, I think um, I had some very talented clients and one of the, one of the tricks of being a talent representative is the trick of making that client feel like they're dependent on you. Uh, like the GDS I salesman for real estate. I, I, I wasn't able to do that. But on the other hand, what that meant was that that the clients, when they became successful, when I got them a job, they were very able to then say, I like you as a person, Steve, but uh, I'm going to change representation. And what that felt like for me was it felt like I was being broken up with like I was having a girlfriend break up with me like every week or every two weeks. And it was a horrible feeling. And I somehow wasn't able to not be that guy who got, um, who got, uh, uh, broken up with. Um, and I'm not sure if that's a failing on my part or if that's a, that's you know a, an evidence of a good quality, but it, but it was just a very bad fit. So oh, I had sense. one client who um, who booked a pilot, and that's like that's like uh, a great thing if you're a talent manager. If um, you because if you have a client who's on a who's on a pilot, if the pilot gets picked up, that could run for twenty years, and that could be 
that could be your nut. That could be, you know, the, the foundation for building for building an office. And I remember when the pilot got picked up to go to series, I was ecstatic. I said, I've turned the corner. This is working. And literally, as I'm calling her up to say, let's go out for dinner, let's celebrate, she's calling me up to tell me, you know, Steve, I'm having this baby and it's going to cost me a lot of money. And I'm already paying an agent. Do you see where this is heading? Oh, wow. That's, uh, and, that's and I pulled the car. I'm driving, in New, I'm driving in LA because that's all we do in LA is drive. I'm driving in LA. <laughs> I pull it to the side of the road and I go, this isn't working. I have to do something else. Um, and, and I wish that I could, I could say that the very next minute I started off on my new career, but it took, uh, you know, eight months to 16 months to, you know, to 18 months of trying to figure it out. But I then made the transition to, doing what I'm doing now, which is teaching workshops and uh, and lecturing. And then I wrote these two books and then that became that became a career. Um, but it was all it was, you know, you you don't I wish I wish that I could say that uh, that my life was like driving a, uh, a fast car in Fast and the Furious. And I did a donut and I turned 180 degrees around and I went back in the right direction. But it's much more like being uh, torpedoed when you're when you're uh, sailing a a big tanker, and it takes a long time to turn the tanker around as you're taking water on. So you're you're bailing out, you're trying to stay afloat, and you're trying to turn around. So that takes a long time. It's arduous. It's agonizing. There are periods in which you're not feeling very chipper. Uh, but ultimately, failure has led me to exactly what I want to do in life. That's amazing. Really happy to hear that. And a key point there is to to me, and who am I to give life advice at 26, but you've gone through quite a challenging period. And it's not so much about how long it took. It's about how you're able to turn it around. You know, that experience, you know, it sounds very gut-wrenching. You're getting broken up with every week, every month but you're able to turn it around and you found your your career calling, which not many people can say they have done that. Well, three times I have, I have invented, invented a career uh, in which there was no, there was no career to be, to be gotten. When I started out, I, I, uh, with the help of two friends, we started a theater company where there wasn't one before. When that went down, I went out and I started um, to do a, uh, I, I pitched myself as a producer uh, in, in Hollywood. And so that was, a, that was a whole career where, you know, I wasn't hired uh, as an employee. I didn't have a desk. I didn't have a phone. Um, I mean, no one gave me that. I created that myself. Then um, after, the, after the zig, when I zigged, you know, with these uh, talent managers, when I should have zagged, I then <laughs> created a, a another career, which is um, consulting uh, and uh, doing workshops, uh, and I'm you know doing workshops around the world. So so it's about I guess part of it is the willingness to invent something that that wasn't there before. That's awesome. It sounds like you're a very resilient person. But you no, not really, not really. But luckily, I can't be an alcoholic. So, so you have to. So, if you can't do that, then you have to do something else. You must have a very strong, well, obviously strong character traits to be able to keep on continuing with kind of your dream. A lot of people, from my experience, you know, if they've got, you know, one bit of bad news or one bit of bad feedback, they might just go, you know what, this is not the career for me and just do something that they don't like or enjoy. But you've been able to actually, you know, go, you know, although this might suck, you've been able to, as you said, reinvent yourself a few times. Right, and, and there are times in which I'm doing something that I don't enjoy because it's leading me on to something that I will enjoy or something that I need to do. So it's, it's, not, yeah. it's, not all, it's not all, you know, um, 
ice, ice cream and uh, and and uh, chocolate. Um, there's there's also you know you have to get up every day and do some hard stuff and do some hard work in order to get where you want to go. Are you now at the stage where you feel your advice and the courses you provide to the public are extremely helpful? From the get go, did you think that you were providing an amazing ex- experience, or has that come with time? Um, I still don't. You know, if if somebody gives me good feedback, they they enjoyed what I did. Uh, it's still, it's not something I go. Oh, yeah, I know that. Yeah, great. Um, uh, and, and if you, um, I, I'm, I'm still vulnerable to, uh, to being, uh, to getting a bad review. So, so if, you know, I'll, I have 162 reviews on Amazon for my first book. And if you, if uh, the 163rd is a one star review that, that will hurt and it'll stay with me for a little bit. And so I'm you... not, I'm not immune to that. Um, and uh, uh, and I'm always I'm always pleasantly surprised when people get back in touch with me and say that it's helped them. Um, I I have a I have a picture of Ricky Gervais uh, reading my book. He tweeted it to me. Uh, Amazing. And he said, "If this doesn't make me funnier, I, I want a refund." <laughs> so 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 far. He hasn't asked me for a refund, and his new show, After Life on Netflix, looks like it was it was created maybe maybe accidentally or maybe on purpose, kind of following some of the stuff that I wrote about in in, in the book. One of the things that I write in the book was um, that comedy is the art of hope, and in one of his uh, interviews on his new show, he says, this comedy is about hope. I went, oh, okay. So he read the book. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Oh, that's fantastic. And it's great to, you know, get a celebrity endorsement as well as also amongst uh, people just starting up. And as we read out at the very start, you've, your some of your students have achieved wonderful things. And some of them are, are selling shoes, but so, so, you know, it's not, it's not yeah, a you win some, you lose some. Yes, exactly. Uh, and I, uh, uh, like, like a doctor, you know, uh, my first rule is first off, try to do no harm. So it's very easy to do that in this day and age. Do you not, feel not, that not so easy, not so easy all the time? E- exactly. Do you feel that you've arrived as, you know, the top consultant, top comedy teacher, or do you feel that you, as you said before, you're you're a student? Or do you feel that you've um, kind of peaked? Where do you view yourself in the scheme of? Well, I'm I'm always a student. I'm always trying to learn more. Um, I don't feel like I have arrived in terms of, um, in in terms of uh, being the top of anything. I, I think that I uh, I do I ha- I I provide a service. I I. I do stuff that has value. I believe that other people believe has value. Uh, I've done a lot of um, a lot of consulting, a lot of uh, story editing for Film Victoria and uh, Screen Australia, for instance. Oh wow! Okay, I'll ask and, you about that uh, off there. And you know, I uh, but I I don't think that um, I don't think that I have. I feel like I've done. A good enough job that I I can uh, hold my head up high, but I don't feel like um, like anybody should bow down to me. Like, oh, this is the no. I'm just I'm just a guy who's who has who does stuff, who has a service, provides a service. I'm a teacher. I'm a lecturer. Uh, I'm an author. I'm a consultant, um, and uh, I I work with writers and directors and producers. What keeps you motivated to continue? Uh, I mean, besides besides like liking to eat. <laughs> uh, I, I'm I'm fascinated. I'm that's fascinated. the best answer I've had. I'm fascinated to work with 
work with talented people. I'm fascinated to work on stories. I'm fascinated to see what other people are working on to to help them. Um, I my job is to help artists achieve their own vision in the best possible way, as opposed to having people write a script the way I think they should write a script. That's not my job. Um, and so uh, I, I, I and pe people ask me to do stuff. And I still I, I I don't spend a lot of time or a lot of organized time in uh, in, in promotion or or PR, but I, I'll get uh, I'll get an email. Would you like to come to Istanbul? And my answer is always yes. Why not? I'd love to come uh -huh. to Istanbul and teach a workshop. Would you like to come to Brazil? You betcha. Uh, and if so, and people have asked me, how do you get all these? all these, you know, uh, gigs all around the world. And I say, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I, I've done a bunch of videos. I've done podcasts like this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the web. I'm, I'm available. I have two books, but it's, it's a mystery to me. And so I wake up every day kind of interested to see what's, uh, what, what's happening in my inbox. If I would have told you 40 years ago when you're still working as a cabbie that you would achieve all of the things that we've just spoken about, how do you think you would have responded? I think I would have been disappointed that I didn't, I didn't become an actor. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fair enough. But uh, would you be able to like look at all the – I guess that was your goal at the very start was yeah. to become an actor. Yeah. But do you still think that you'd be – pleasantly surprised or would you more focus on the acting component um well if you told me uh 40 years ago when i'm driving when i'm driving a cab uh from four o'clock in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon to three o'clock in the morning would you also tell me you know would i have a girlfriend i mean it you have a beautiful ten... wife of how oh, many see, well years. now you're talking now you're talking now now that that young uh cab drivers now he's excited because yeah, wow, because I mean, yeah, you're not meeting many girls uh, driving a cab. Believe me, believe you me. <laughs> my, uh, my friend, he's a he's gonna he loves it every time I bring him up in the in the podcast. He's got I think five hundred thousand subscribers, and he does Uber and he records his passengers with their permission. And he does funny videos, and it's really like it's become very viral, and he's doing really well, and he's met some really cool people, but. I don't think he would date anyone in his cab, even though he's had quite a lot of offers. I am I am very excited to hear that. That that is great. There there was no Uber or or, or podcasts or internet back when I was driving a cab. There were just cabs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh I guess I guess if you told me what I did, um I feel I feel like the way I feel now. I feel like okay, okay, good job. Good job. Yeah. You've you've earned you. Uh, I I've earned my space. Oh, amazing! I'm very happy to hear that. What role has your upbringing played in your career? Have you did you have the support of family and friends early on in your career? By support, do you mean do you mean uh, you know they they thought it was a good idea? Yes, I, that is how think... you interpret it. I mean, uh, well, they they didn't throw themselves in front of in front of me to stop me from doing it, but uh, I think they always thought I'd grow out of it. That that it, that you know, my father would always say, only half jokingly, you know, you can always go to you know get a job in civil service, you know, but, um, you know, a government work, uh, but I, I think. Uh, I think they saw that I probably was was not going to be very good at like having an office job, and so as long as uh, I wasn't living with them, <laughs> that was the, <laughs> that was the improvement. Ah, uh, great. Well, and... he's not he's not living here, so I guess it's going okay. Ah, uh, that's great. Even if you're living in a shelter under a bus, but. You're not in the house. So that's I that wasn't. I was. I. I was living in a terrible apartment on the Upper East Side of New York, um, with. Uh, I mean, literally the 
I was taking a shower one day and the roof from the floor above caved down on me. Um, <laughs> but, um, but even then, their 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 bottom line was, well, at least he's not living at home. Oh, that's all that matters. You come out with a broken arm, like, yeah, but he's not here, so that's all good. At least he's not living at home. And and at that time, I I had a girlfriend, so it was the perfect it was the perfect excuse to move in somewhere. You you know what? That just reminded me of a story. So I did a commerce degree. I apparently did it at one of the best universities in Australia. And I remember one of my first classes. You know, I'm, I'm learning accounting. I think this is going to be my career, and I just hear a thud. And I look around and I don't know where that thud's come from. And I see this big rat running up the wall onto the roof and then just landing on the floor again. And it did it about five or six times. And I've never laughed harder in my life. I, I admire the rat for trying. And I said that <laughs> a little bit with uh, some of the writing and stuff that I've done. You know, you, you can't get back into the roof. You've fallen and you keep on trying to get up and you keep on falling. But to my surprise, he actually got into the roof. And I don't know how he did it. I don't know how physics work. And the fact that you were laughing and none of the other students were looking up from their uh, from their ledgers, their double entry ledgers, showed you that you were in the wrong career. Yes, exactly. And I learned that very quickly that accounting was not for me. But I, I, I put into perspective that if I didn't do accounting, perhaps I wouldn't be doing some of the comedy and the writing and all the other stuff that I'm doing. So I'm quite grateful for it. And uh, my father was an accountant. So there oh, you go. So is my dad as well. So there you go. My father was uh, worked for um, uh, here in the States. It's the IRS. It's the tax people. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We we know all about American systems through uh, TV shows. Probably uh, know right. more about America than we do about Australia. A lot of artists have told me that these are some of the emotions or creatives that these are some of the emotions that run through their mind, whether it's lack of confidence, anxiety, shame, loss of courage, embarrassment, or fear of failure, to name a few. But in some cases, they use these negative emotions to produce better material. Do you share this experience? Um, well, I certainly use the fear as, as an engine. Um, uh, you know, when you're starting off doing anything for the first time, um, there's there's a certain uh, amount of trepidation and fear, and you just use that to kind of energize whatever you're doing. Uh, first day in a rehearsal hall, first you know when you first get up in front of a group of people and you don't know how they're going to respond. Um, so you, you use it because that's what's happening to you. Um, and, and it's real and it's true. And so to deny it is to be false. And I, I believe that the best comedy comes out of truth. So, yep. so if, you know, if you're, if whatever I'm feeling on the day in which I'm getting up in front of uh, 40 or 80 or 200 people or two people, I've got to go with that. That's, that's what's happening to me. That's the reality of the moment. And that's how I'm going to start approaching what I have to do. Okay. And do you think it would have been possible to get to where you are without experiencing any of that? I don't believe, I don't believe that. Uh, no, I mean, you, you, all the negative emotions, all the negative stuff in your head, um, uh, you you have to you have to play through it, not 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 ignore it. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's 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 part of who you are. It's part of um, and and certainly for comedians, they have to they have to acknowledge uh, those those voices in their head. Uh, they shouldn't give in to them, but they certainly have to work with them. And yeah. some, most of the, a lot of great comedy comes out of confronting and and owning those 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 fears and those anxieties. Um, uh, most of modern comedy is about it's about comics, writers, or performers uh, uh, acknowledging their anxiety and their fear and doing it anyway. 
It's very interesting. I had lunch with a friend and he was saying anxiety is the one thing where the more you try and control it, the harder it gets. And the, like the goal of trying to improve anxiety is to like control it. As I said, it's to kind of like just be at ease with it, which I found very surprising. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of a Zen thing. You, you, you have to acknowledge it and you have to surrender to it and then see where it, see where it leads you. See, see what, where that energy or what that energy, you know, has, has in store for you in terms of, well, what can I do with this energy? And, and as a comic, you have to acknowledge it, um, uh, acknowledge the, uh, the absurdity of it, the reality of it. Uh, there's, um, I don't know whether it's, it's, uh, showing in in Australia, but uh, Pete Holmes has this wonderful sitcom on HBO that just got canceled called Crashing. And in the very last episode, spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> he's, he's opening uh, his his terrible talent manager uh, tells him that John Mulaney uh, wants him to open for him. So he gets there. He, it's, it's Carnegie Hall, and it's oh, it's oh, it's amazing. And he gets there, and John Mulaney says, "Who are you?" He says, "I'm Pete Holmes." And I said, and John Mulaney says, "I didn't want Pete Holmes. I wanted Ben Holmes." And so, <laughs> uh, what was his the height of his uh, his his ecstasy? He's now feeling terrible, and so he's kind of hanging around backstage, just feeling terrible. When it turns out that they're not able to get anybody to replace him, so he has to go out and do a set. And and uh, John Mulaney gives him one word of advice: don't be bad. And so he goes out there, and his entire and of course this is a scripted half hour show, and of course they scripted him a great set. But what his set comes out of is telling the audience, "I'm not supposed to be here." So you know, I'm you know, I, and 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 he has this hilarious set. Uh, and of course, the extras are, are all told to laugh at it. But he has this really hilarious set that comes out of that terrible moment of being fired and having somebody, having John Mulaney on the phone, looking for somebody to replace Pete Holmes while Pete Holmes is sitting right in the same dressing room. Um, and it's it's both cathartic and funny, and at the same time, it's it's uh, it's Owning what's happening and and owning what's happening, but having the perspective to see what's ridiculous about it. And that's that's the art of doing stand up. On that topic, is there a common theme you see your students struggle with? They all try to be funny. Funny when they shouldn't be or they're trying to force the funny? Well, most of my most of the people who are taking my workshops are trying to write scripts or or teleplays, um, and the the problem I see more than almost anything else is trying too hard to be jokey, um, whereas that's not as important as simply uh, having a great premise, having interesting relatable characters and seeing what happens to them as they as they try to navigate this either impossible or improbable premise how do you help them with that i i have them focus on what what what's the premise uh who are the characters and then allow the characters to be human enough to not know what to do and then and then and then Rather than you creating things for them, obstacles for them, people create their own obstacles. Just try to see what this character would do. Don't try. Don't worry about being clever or witty. Let it, you know, uh, steal steal from life. What would your What would you say? What would your dad say? What would your aunt, you know, Esther say? What What would your uncle Murray say? And what would they do? Make them Make them human beings because human beings are funny. And you, you know how I know that? Because when all when your family uh, gets together at, at Christmas dinner, you know how, how ridiculous they are. 
So you don't, have to, you don't have to invent human behavior. You just have to observe it and 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 steal it and and uh, rep, you know uh, take it and represent it. That's actually what I do for my writing. All the characters are based somewhat on someone I know, and it makes it a lot easier to write when you can right. kind of envision them. Because you can hear their voices. Yeah. But then at the same time, I kind of feel like I'm a phony. I'm like, I'm only writing because of other people. But you add your own uh, flair to it and you change a few things here and there and you develop the character. But I, I've i created a lot of uh, characters in the sitcom that I'm writing, well over 15, and they're all based on people that I know. Well, well, you know what, you know what uh, Picasso said? Picasso said that great artist that good artists create, but great artists steal. <laughs> you're a great artist, you start, you know, just steal. Steal like crazy. Is there any advice you would like to give young aspiring comedians or actors or writers or uh, Yes. Yes. Uh, and- no one okay, uh, I can give you uh, two very important pieces of advice. One, no one knows anything. <laughs> and, certainly, and certainly no one knows anything uh no one knows any any more than you do so i can tell you the number of people uh in in college who said oh that person's going to be a big star and that person's wasting their time but it turned out that the person that they thought was wasting their time was a lead in many movies and the person they thought was going to be a big star uh sells real estate no one knows anything. Um, and so there's no there's no such a thing as, well, this person has it. This person doesn't have it. If that were true, then, you know, then uh, uh, Rob Schneider would not have a career. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, if somebody's opinion is 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 what so don't listen to anybody who tells you oh you're going to make it or you're not going to make it because they don't know the only thing that's going to be predictive of whether you make it or not is how badly you want it and how willing you are to do it is necessary to get where you want to be and what kind of resources you have to bring to bear now if uh you like to eat and you don't want to suffer, then probably uh, a life in the arts may not be yours. Although I can think of a lot of stories where people, you know, kind of roll out of bed, hit it rich, you know, make it big and, and they never look back. So so no one knows anything. So that's that's the first thing. And And so if you have a dream, there's no reason whether you're a 26 year old or a 36-year-old, or a 48-year-old, or a 68-year-old, why you shouldn't pursue your dreams. Um, the And the other thing is, oh, I guess there are two more things. The other thing is the color, the color, uh, what's that word? I can't pronounce it. You're going to have to edit that out. Uh, <laughs> colorary, I can't, the I'm else. Sure the, word. Um, the, 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 the sidebar to that is that there's no guarantee you will make it. Uh, So what what happens if you don't? Or what happens if you don't make it right now? Or what happens if you don't make it this year? Or what happens if you don't make it in two years? What's your your B plan? You have to have a B plan because there's no guarantee. No matter how much you want it, no matter how big your dream is, no matter how important your dream is to you, there's no guarantee. So you have to have 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 a feeling or, or you have to figure out well, what's the bottom line? What 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 do you really want to do? I thought I was going to be an actor. It didn't turn out that way, but I managed to figure out a way to be in the arts anyway, even though I wasn't that good an actor. Now, the the last thing I would say is that uh, one of the predictive elements in comedy is that people uh, learn from one another. And they build their careers on one another. I mean, look at all the people who have come out of The Daily Show or Second City or UBC or 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 SNL. Um, and uh, and those people who came from SNL, they started out uh, in a comedy club or they started out at the Groundlings or they started out at Second City or they started out at, at UBC. So 
the the last piece of advice is look around the room that you're in if you're the funniest person in that room find another room oh, don't be the funniest person that you know in that room surround yourself with people who are as funny if not funnier than you are who are doing kind of the same thing you want to do maybe in 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 different ways or or with different emphases surround yourself with creative funny people and get better learning from them well i'm gonna have to apply well all your advice but that one in particular because i need more funny people around me <laughs> well, i mean for instance you're i mean uh what's a small town in australia uh you, bendigo okay so if you're in bendigo how are you gonna how are you gonna write that great script you could maybe but it would be better if you if you went to melbourne you see right now melbourne is probably a pretty good place to uh to try to become a comedian or try to write comedy because there's a lot of people in melbourne who are trying to be funny right there yeah. are improv groups there's comedy clubs and maybe if you want to if you maybe you feel like well the place where i need to be is where they're hiring people to write these comedy shows maybe i need to move to sydney or maybe i need to move to new york or los angeles or chicago or toronto but you need to be don't be the funniest person in the room find find a find a room in which you're among the funny people not the funniest what's the best way for people to contact you they they can get in touch with me at www.kaplancomedy.com or they can tweet me on Twitter at SK Comedy or uh, follow me on Facebook uh, at Kaplan Comedy. Um, and uh, if you're, you know, read my books, The Hidden Tools of Comedy or The Comic Hero's Journey. And if you're a, a producer or director or writer who would like me to uh, take a look at your script and, and give you notes, that's what I do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. That was really great. Thank you. Steve is incredibly knowledgeable. I'm fascinated that he has had the determination and courage to keep on reinventing himself despite the challenges he has faced. He talks about fear and the many shapes and forms it takes and how most times fear is greater than it needs to be and often the very thing that is feared becomes less important and not so intimidating as we thought it might be. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast in case you miss any. They come out roughly 5 p.m. Monday, Melbourne, Australia time. If you'd like to keep up to date with the latest Funny in Failure news, we're on Instagram and Facebook under the name Funny in Failure. Thank you for listening to the Funny in Failure podcast, exploring the deeper side of comedy.